I'm sure you guys have those stories in your family that have been told over and over and over and over again. Anyone in here have like a really good storyteller in your family? But you've heard those stories repeatedly like over and over and over. For me, it, it was my grandpa. And it is my grandpa. We, we call him Bumpa. That's my grandpa. His name's Bumpa. And he would always tell me and my older brother stories. Some were real stories, some were family stories, and some were stories that he made up. There's a few that I, I'll never forget because he told them so many times, and we loved these stories. There's one story he actually made up. It was called The Black Coffin. That sounds scary, right? It's about this guy who's literally in this almost like a haunted house. And this coffin, like, you know, like what dead bodies are in, like coffins, right? This coffin is chasing after him trying to get him, trying to nab him, trying to like, I, I don't know what the end result would be, but this coffin is chasing this guy, so he's running through the house trying to escape from this coffin. He goes through different doors and locks them, but the, the coffin busts through. He puts chains over doors, and the coffin busts through, and, and he starts to use all these different weapons. He tries a sword, but the sword breaks on the coffin, and he tries guns, but it just, it just absorbs the bullets, and my grandpa would always use uh, so many sound effects. He'd be like, and then he had this machine gun from World War II, and he'd, like he'd, he'd, do all, he'd get a bazooka, and he'd load that bazooka on his shoulder, and he'd shoot it at the coffin, and it put a big hole in the coffin, but then the hole just filled up again, and the coffin kept t coming towards him. And the coffin got closer and closer. Everything he tried didn't work. And as a last-ditch effort before the coffin's about to get him, he searches his pockets. He's got nothing left, but he finds a cough drop, and he gives it to the coffin, and it stops. And that was the story of the black coffin. Get it? Coffin? A cough drop? It stopped the coffin? Uh, it's a story my grandpa made up. For years, he would tell us. He also told this other story of this Indian brave this young man, this young Native American who lived on one of the largest lakes in America. And he would regularly hear this voice of this girl across the lake. He couldn't see her, but he could hear her voice, and, and he fell in love with this voice. And eventually they would start calling back and forth to each other for, for days, for weeks, for months, for years, and until one day he couldn't take it anymore. He had to meet the girl behind this voice. He had to meet the love of his life. So he says, I'm going to take the journey across this lake. So he starts swimming, and she's calling out to him. I don't know what the voice would be. Ah, right? She's calling out to him, and he's swimming, and, and he's starting to get tired, though. He's only a quarter of the way across, but he can make out her voice more clearly, and, and he keeps swimming. He gets about halfway across. He can actually see her silhouette. He can see her. It's the first time he's even gotten any sort of image of the love of his life, of the girl behind this voice, and he gets about three-fourths of the way across, and she's encouraging him. She's shouting to him, I love you, my love. Come over here. You're going to make it, but that young Indian brave drowns. But they actually decided, because of his courage, because of his bravery, they decided to name that lake after that young man. You know what they called that lake? Lake Stupid. <laughs> That's another one my grandpa made up. But it's these stories I will never forget as, as long as I live, because he told them over and over and over. And what happens as you hear these stories, they start to stick with you. They start to stay with you. They start to mean something to you. Like the story of the black coffin, as weird as it sounds, it's like precious to me. Like it's a story I'll probably tell my kids one day. It's a story that hopefully they'll pass on to their kids one day. And they're stupid stories. But now picture more important stories. It's what we're going to read today. It's the story of the Passover it's this story that this was thousands of years ago. This thing called the Passover happens, and it gets passed on from generation to generation to generation. To this day, if you are Jewish or you know someone who's Jewish, they still celebrate the Passover because it's so special, because it's so important, because this story, this true story has been passed down from generation to generation. They're told to remember it every year. Why is it so special? 
Well, it's Exodus 12, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. If the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. So the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. So what's happening? The Lord is starting to, God is starting to institute this thing. This thing called the Passover. And he starts, the first thing he says, I want you to take a lamb. A perfect lamb. A, a, a lamb without blemish. Not like your, your lamb who's missing a leg. Not your lamb whose like, wool is like all patchy and messed up. Dirty, filthy, sick. But like your best lamb. Your most perfect lamb that you have. I want you to take it. I want you to bring it into the house. I actually want it to live with the family for four days. Now it's one thing. If you guys know anything about like farming. Like farmers, like they have their animals, and then they kill them. <laughs> right? you, you know, where does, where does beef come from? Where does chicken come from? Eventually, you kill these animals for this meat. You're not attached to it, right? Farmers aren't naming Bessie right before they kill Bessie, right? They're not having the cow come and live in the house with them. Why? Because what happens when you bring an animal in your house? Anyone here have a pet, right? What happens when you bring it into your house? you get attached. You start to love it. You start to cherish it. Picture you have all these, all these lambs in your yard, and all they are is like meat, and, and for milk, and for wool, and for whatever it is, and then one day you bring it in, and all the, oh yeah, we have a little lamb. It's our new pet. I love it. Can lamb sleep with me? Can it stay in my room? I love it so much, and, and one day, two days, three days, four days goes by, and then, all right, time to kill our new pet. <laughs> That's what happens right here. And they go and, and they have to give, uh, kill this lamb that they have grown close to. Why? Because there needs to be a very precious sacrifice for this thing called Passover. And you see this progression. He says, grab a lamb. So it's like a lamb, no big deal. And then he says, the lamb, very specific. And then he says, take your lamb. You've grown closer to this lamb. This is a very costly, precious sacrifice that's about to be made. And then what happens? Because it sounds kind of weird. Just, all right, get a lamb, have it live with you for four days, and then kill it. It gets weirder. <laughs> Verse 7. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning. And what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, so you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So what's going to happen? They're going to have this thing called the Passover take place. And God says, I want you to be ready. I want your sandals on, your robes on. I want everything ready because as soon as this happens, you're leaving. You're leaving Egypt. You're going to get out of this place. You're going to go. You're going to be freed. I've been telling Pharaoh to let my people go. This is going to be the thing that breaks him. So you got to be ready. But here's what you're going to do. You're going to take that perfect lamb that's lived with you, that's precious, that's lived in your house, and you're going to kill it. And then you're literally going to take its blood, and I, we can throw that picture up on the center screen, and you're going to put it around your door. You're going to put it on the sides. You're going to put it on top. That sounds crazy, right? You're going to cover your house with the blood, just the door of this perfect lamb. You're going to cover it up. You're going to do this, and then you're going to go in, and you're going to eat. <laughs> right? That's kind of weird, right? Can you imagine, like... I don't know if you guys ever, like, cook at home, but, like, you, get, you know, you get, like, the chicken juice on your hands when you're dealing with, like, chicken breast or thighs or whatever. And it's like, oh, like, imagine, like, I don't know, just having these guts all over you and you're putting it on your door and then you go in and you're like, all right, let's eat it, right? But he's like, you're going to go in and eat. You're going to eat this, this lamb. You're going to eat these bitter herbs. 
You're going to eat these, these bitter herbs, yeah? And, and you're going to eat all of it. You're not going to let any of it remain. Now, this is interesting. Why, why is this? There's a couple of reasons. We're going to see great power in the blood in a second, and I'll get there. But here's what's going to happen. This is something they're going to do every year. They're going to do every year. And what's happening is this, this blood is actually going to spare them. Well, what do you mean? Well, any house that doesn't have this blood on it, the firstborn in that house is going to be killed that night. They're going to die. But if you have this blood on your door, you're going to be saved. Why? Because of the sacrifice of this lamb. So what's going to happen every year you do this and this story gets passed on from generation to generation to generation. You guys know anything about blood? Blood stains, right? <laughs> you ever get blood on like a white shirt or white fabric? Am I the only one here? Okay, well, okay, there you go. All right, it's really hard to get blood out. So what happens is they put this on their door and every day they go into their house, they're remembering the sacrifice of the lamb. They're seeing the lamb's blood on their door. They're reminded that they were spared, that their household was spared, that their firstborn was spared because this lamb died for them. And then they're told to eat these, these bitter herbs, which is kind of interesting, but everything about this is very symbolic. Why eat bitter herbs? Anyone like bitter food? Not really. Like bitter is not like a good taste, right? Why eat these bitter herbs? So they could be reminded that they used to be in bondage. The bitterness of slavery. The bitterness of their time in Egypt. Remember being enslaved. Remember being tortured. Remember being in pain. Because what will happen after a while, if, if they don't remind themselves of this lamb's sacrifice, they might start looking back and going, I want to be back in Egypt. I want to be back in this place. I want, to, I want to go back there. Things were good there. But they need to be reminded of how bad it was. And what happens at, at the end of this in verse 11, it says, It is the Lord's Passover. It is the Lord's Passover. If you guys haven't caught on yet, the story sounds very familiar, right? And this is the Lord's Passover. But here's the thing. Jesus was our Passover, Jesus was our Passover. What do I mean by this? Look at this, this story right here. The lamb had to live with them, became precious to them. Didn't Jesus come and live amongst humans for a season, get to know them, spend time in their homes, walked here on earth? And what happened is, is he became very precious to those around him, to the disciples, to all of these things. If he was just a random dude who happened to just die on the cross one day, it wouldn't have meant much. But he came, he walked the earth, he lived with us, he spent time with us. He did all of these things. He was perfect. Just like this perfect lamb that's going to be roasted over fire, which Jesus faces literally the fire of God's wrath. The bitterness, the bitter herbs, the bitterness of God's judgment. He's got to drink this bitter cup of judgment. His blood is going to be shed. And yes, it's not going to be put on a door like this, but his blood's going to be shed on a cross. On two pieces of wood in the ground. And we're going to see this blood that is where all of the power is. And it's a reminder to us. What do I, what do I mean, guys? We've got to remember the gospel every single day. As I tell this story about Jesus, this guy who died on the cross, rose again from the dead, was perfect for us. We need to remember this every day. If you're in this room today and you consider yourself a Christian, here's something you're probably guilty of, and, and I'm guilty of it too. Well, how, why, why are you a Christian? What's that mean? Well, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And you just say it really casually. Anyone ever just say that really casually? Jesus died for me. No, am I the only one? Am I the only one guilty of this? I, I've said this so casually. But if, if, if I had to face a bloody cross every day and look at it and go, wow, that's what he did for me. If I remind myself of what it meant that Jesus died for me, picture this. You're in your house. I'm not trying to scare you guys with like a horror story. But you're in your house at night. Someone breaks in. They actually pull a gun on you and are threatening you. And they're getting ready to take your life. And what happens is your, your dad or your mom, grandma, grandpa, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, I don't know who it is, but someone in your family comes running. And at the last second, they push you out of the way and they take that bullet for you. And they die in your place. 
when you tell people about that, when you think about that, you're going to be like, yeah, you know, my dad died for me. What's up? <laughs> right? Are you going to say it casually like that? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I shouldn't be here today, but my mom died for me. <laughs> that, like, if that happened, if that happened, every time I thought of that, I, I'd get emotional. The, the thought of my dad pushing me out of the way, taking a bullet for me, literally dying for me, that, w- that should bring tears to my eyes. That should bring me to a place of, of great mourning, of great sadness, but even of, of joy, of happiness, knowing that I was so loved by my father that he was willing to give his life for me. I would start to look at my life as a lot more precious I would start to even go, what am I doing with my life? My dad died for me. Maybe I should start doing more with myself. Maybe I should set a better legacy for myself because he died for me for a reason. I'm going to do something about it. But that's the reality for us as Christians. That's what Jesus did for us. And when we think about it, it should do something in us. It should stir emotion. And I'm not up here trying to get like an emotional response from you guys. I'm not like trying to, but, but it literally should. If, if you think of the gospel and what it means, you should get emotional. Not because I'm trying to get you emotional, but because it is emotional. Jesus died for you. Think about what that means. He suffered for you. He was tortured for you. But it's not just that. You shouldn't just feel bad. Yes, he did it because we sinned. But you should feel overwhelmed by love. He loved you that much. He cared about you in a world where it's very easy to feel unloved. If you've ever felt unloved in this room, right, to know that God loves you that much, that he's willing to lay down his life. God loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You're so loved. If you ever feel unloved, know that's a lie. Because people are going to fail you. Your parents might fail you. Your friends might fail you. Your teachers, your guidance, can, whoever it is, is going to fail you at some point because we're not perfect. But God never will. And his love will never fail. His love for you will never change. It's the greatest love imaginable, but we've got to be reminded. We've got to remember the gospel every single day. If you start your day being reminded of what the gospel means, your life will change. Verse 12. For I'll pass through the land of Egypt on that night. I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall strike, uh, shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. That's what I was talking about. Keep it through all generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. Whoever eats leavened bread from the first day to the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Skip ahead, verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, strike the lintel to doorposts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. What is happening? God is showing us the power of this this blood that's on the door. He's telling us how powerful the blood is. And when we talk about the blood of Jesus, it can sound like a creepy thing. Like, if you're, not, if you're not a Christian and you hear all this talk of blood, it can sound weird. And if you don't understand it and grasp it, believe me, I understand. It sounds weird. In a little bit, we're going to take communion. And we're going to be like, hey, we're going to drink the blood. And you all are going to be like, whoa, this is weird. You probably heard Christians say, I'm covered by the blood, brother. Right? Doesn't that sound weird? Like, you don't look like there's red liquid all over you. Like, it sounds like it's out of, like, a scary movie or something. But we've got to understand the symbolism behind this. See, they could have sacrificed the lamb. They, they, they could have eaten the dinner. But without the blood, they still would have been judged. Without the blood on their door, it wasn't just the death of the lamb, but it's actually the blood covering their home that saved them. Even the Egyptians, if an Egyptian wanted to, they could have done this. 
and they could have put the lamb's blood on their door and they, or their household would have been okay. Because it's about the blood. It's about this powerful thing called blood. The blood of the sacrifice of the lamb. And then he starts talking about this thing called leaven. Right? He says you're going to eat unleavened bread. What, what's so? Remember I said everything here is very symbolic. This thing called leaven. You guys know what leaven is? It's not short for 11. I'll tell you that. Right? <laughs> right? Leaven is, is basically it's like yeast. You put it in dough and it's what makes it puff up. So otherwise, you'd have like a flat cracker, right? But if you put leaven, you don't even need a much. You just put a little bit in, and what it does is it spreads. It fills it up. It puffs the bread up. Leaven is very symbolic of this thing called sin. Now, just a little bit of sin in our lives can make us, makes us corrupt. It puffs us up. It fills our whole body. It doesn't take much. It takes one little thing called sin. But then Moses says, I want you to take hyssop, and I want you to put this blood on your doorframe. And this thing called hyssop was symbolic of purification through sacrifice. And God says when he sees the blood, he, he looks for the blood on us. What do I mean? When we come to Jesus, what we're saying is, Jesus, I believe you shed your blood for the forgiveness of my sin. There's not literally blood hanging all over us. It's not this weird, creepy thing. But we're marked by our creator. We're literally covered by the perfect sacrifice Jesus gave us. When God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin. He doesn't see our leaven. He doesn't see that. But he sees the perfection that is Jesus. And we're covered by that because of what he did for us. And then verse 24 says, You shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. Pass it on, pass it on, pass it on. Tell this story, tell this story until it sticks. Verse 25, it'll come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as he promised that you shall keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? That you shall say it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Verse 28, then the children of Israel went away and did so, just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. So what's happening now? You guys, I understand everything we're talking about can sound confusing. I get it. It's confusing. I studied it, and it's still slightly confusing to me. It can sound confusing. But I love what it says there. It says, when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You guys, start asking questions about your faith. I don't want you just to hear me say all this and leave here and go, I'm confused. Ask questions. When we go to groups, ask your leader questions. Come to me, ask questions. When you start to ask questions, you start to bring understanding. You start to go to a deeper place. See, God knew when they would do this thing called Passover that one day kids would be like, why are we doing this? Why are we killing a lamb? Why are we eating bitter herbs? Can't we just put some garlic and butter on our herbs? Like, do they have to be bitter? Like, kids love asking questions, right? You guys are around a little kid. They love to ask questions, right? Like, why do I have two eyes if I only see one thing, right? Couldn't you see a little kid asking that, right? Little kids love to ask questions. Why did swear words get invented if we're not allowed to use them? right? Little kids love to ask crazy questions, right? Where do thoughts come from? <laughs> it's a good one, right? Or I like this one. Why, why, does, why does I'm up for it and I'm down for it have the same meaning? <laughs> right? Little kids love to ask questions, and you know what happens when they ask questions? You start to wonder, like, you're smart. Where did you come up with that? How did you think of that? And you start to question, you start to ask, and what happens is you go on this quest and this thirst for knowledge and understanding, and this should be us in our faith. Ask questions, and when you do, it's going to lead you to a place of deeper relationship, of deeper understanding with the Lord, and I love what happens after this. Then it says, the people bowed their heads and worshiped. They worshiped. This is before it happened. They worshiped before it happened. But what happens is they so trust God's promises. 
They so trust the work that he's done. They've seen the plagues hit Egypt. They've seen the frogs, the lice, the darkness, the hail, the fire. They've seen all these things. And they go, what God says he's going to do, he does. And even though the Passover hasn't happened, we're going to worship. And we're going to praise him. And we're going to give him glory before it even happens. Do you trust God's promises? You don't have to answer that out loud, but here's, here's what happens when you pass on these stories. As they tell the story of Passover, as they pass it on to their children and their children and their children's children, and all, all the way down, what happens is, is there's this trust that is built. There's this understanding that's built. And there's this faith that is built. And, and what happens is even before you're, even when you're in the middle of your storm, when you're in the middle of your mess, when you're in the middle of whatever it is, you hold on trusting God's promises because it's been instilled in you that you can, that you do believe. So much so that right, before, right after Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper on Passover, when he's about to die on the cross and suffer, we're actually told in the book of Mark that he sang a hymn. And most people would, would agree that it's from Psalm 118. Jesus is about to die on the cross. He's about to suffer. Do you know what words he sings? This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Can you imagine singing that when you know you're about to die? But Jesus, I understand he's God, but he, he knows God has it. He knows there's a plan. He knows God's on the throne. He knows he's in control. So he worships. He trusts. So what happens, verses 29 through 30, I won't read it. But what happens is the destroyer <laughs> comes over the land. All the firstborns in Egypt die. All the people who have the blood on their door survive. And God says, hey, you weren't going to give me my firstborn Israel I'm going to take your firstborn. And then even more so, there's this great deliverance we see in Passover. But then God said, hey, you know what? I'm going to give humanity. I'm going to give the world my firstborn, Jesus. And when I see my son on them, when I see his blood covering them, I'm going to pass over. And you guys, if you've been here any length of time, worship team, you guys can come up. You know that I, I love to talk about my own life. And not always in a sense of, like, sometimes I'm prideful, I get it. <laughs> but not in a sense of, look how awesome I am, or look what I've done. Or, but I love to go, look what God did. I love to talk about different points in my life of trials, of troubles, of, of moments where it's like, I could have never gotten through that without God. I love to tell stories of God's faithfulness. I love to tell stories of miracles I've seen him perform. I love to tell stories of how I saw uh, a blind guy in Mexico healed when he, when he prayed to receive Jesus, when, when two seventh graders and two ninth graders prayed for him. I love to tell uh, stories of, of my childhood. I, I, I love, as weird as it sounds, to talk about my parents' divorce. I love to talk about... Uh, when my crazy, evil stepmom would, would take us out of bed in the middle of the night and sit us on the couch and tell us how horrible we were as we were middle schoolers, me and my older brother. You're like, Sean, why do you love to tell these stories? Because I love to tell what God did through those moments. I love talking about how my dad, uh, not how my dad, how God brought my mom through breast cancer, how he built her faith through that and in return built my faith through that because my mom's passing on the stories of God's faithfulness in her own life saying, this is how I got through it. This is how I was able to get through this trial. This is how I was able to get through this trouble. I love to talk about my, when my grandma died at the family reunion because I saw God's faithfulness in that moment. When my uncle took his life, like as crazy as it is, I like to, to bring it up because I see God's faithfulness even in that deepest, darkest trial. And my hope and prayer is if you hear stories of God's faithfulness enough, like the nation of Israel did with Passover, that it'll stick with you. That it won't just be a black coffin story. That it won't just be a, a story of, of uh, I forgot what the other one was, Lake Stupid. But it would be a story that you hold on to. And one day, when you're going through it, maybe, maybe your mom goes through cancer. Maybe your wife one day or your husband deals with a sickness. And you go, man, when I was in middle school, I remember Sean talked about how his mom grew really close to God through that. And how he, she... She stuck with him. 
and how he was with her and how he gave her peace. Like, I hope you remember that. I hope when you one day deal with a, a tragedy, when you deal with the loss of a loved one, you can look on and go, man, I remember when that story was told. And Sean said he could have ran from God, but he ran to God, and he gave him peace that surpassed all understanding. God did a work. Sean talked about how when his grandma died, that that he got to teach in 670 and 30 people gave their life to Jesus. And I'm going to use this for good. Like, I hope those stories stick with you because they're all about Jesus and they're all about the gospel and they're all about his faithfulness. And you hear it enough, it sticks with you and you start to trust him. So here's what we're going to do. Jesus instituted this thing called communion. And it's, he did it on Passover. And what he did, if you guys want to open this, this top part, if you don't have elements, you can, you can raise your hand, and we'll get those passed out to you. I'm just going to say you guys be quiet as you're doing. I know this makes noise when you open it, but he, he took bread on the night before he died, and with his disciples, he said, hey, here's what we're going to do. I'm instituting a new thing called the Lord's Supper, and what I want you to do is you're going to take this bread, and you're actually going to break it, and you're going to pass it around. And you guys notice this is flat? Why? Remember how they ate unleavened bread? Right? We're eating unleavened bread or wafer. And he said, I want you to take this and I want you to break it just like my body is going to be broken. And then I want you to eat it when you get together and you do it to remember me. Guys, we take communion. As I said, remember the gospel every day. We take this as a chance to remember what he did for us. And he said, take Eat. This is my body broken for you. Let's eat. And then he took a cup of wine. We have grape juice. We can open that part up. It's a little harder. Just be careful. Try not to spill. And he told his disciples, hey, when you get together, this wine, this drink, this juice that you're going to drink, this represents my blood. We talked about the power in the blood, right? That is shed for you. For the forgiveness of your sins, that, that would give you eternal life, that, that when God comes to judge the world one day, that he's going to look on and see the blood that's covering you, the blood that's over your door, and you're going to drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink. Let's pray, and we'll get into a time of worship.